you have to get rid of screens. You have to get rid of screens. You have to get rid of screens. And obviously all I can do is just give them the parent training and they take it or leave it. And I would say maybe, you know, 20 to 30% of the parents actually do it. And the ones who don't do it, I tend to see those kids go on to college and they end up dropping out for that reason exactly, because the screens were not taken care of when they were kids. Welcome to the ADHD Guys Podcast with Mike McLeod of Grow Now ADHD and Ryan Wexelblatt of ADHD Dude. Learn about parenting kids with ADHD from two male licensed professionals who specialize in ADHD and executive functions. No fluffy parenting advice, only practical information that will help you help your child. Hey everyone, welcome to the ADHD Guys Podcast. I'm Mike McLeod, and I'm an executive functioning specialist. And I'm Ryan Wexelblad. I'm a licensed clinical social worker who specializes in ADHD. So today we're going to talk about a topic that Mike and I have a difference of opinion about in some areas. And we wanted to do this because typically I think we pretty much agree on everything. This is one where maybe we have some differences of opinion about, and it's something we haven't really spoken about fully. So I want to hear, you know, I want to talk about those differences because you know, basically I want to see if, if kind of, you know, what your, your feelings about this makes sense for me. And, you know, if we can kind of come to a, you know, agreement about everything here and I'm not sure if we can, but I think it'll be interesting to talk about. So Mike, what are we talking about today? So today we're going to talk about the one thing that really goes hand in hand with ADHD and this is screens and screen use. I would say just about every, Just about every student I've seen since I began working with kids with ADHD, the vast majority of them have some sort of screen addiction, excessive screen use, dysregulation due to screens, and it's a really major concern that the parents have and why they're seeking services out in the first place. So when it comes to ADHD and the neurodiverse brain of ADHD, what is it about this ADHD brain that makes them so highly prone to high screen use? screen addiction, and getting lost into that world of heavy screen use and social media. So I think that's a good place to start before we talk about the part we don't agree on there. So why don't don't you explain that? Yeah. So basically, one of the easiest ways to describe it is the ADHD brain produces much less dopamine than the neurotypical brain. So that really is the feel-good neurotransmitter of the brain. That is the reward system the neurotransmitter that makes you feel good, that lets you know you're doing something right now that makes you happy, that you're doing something that makes you comfortable and safe. And it's just a true reward center, you know, the brain letting you know that you are doing something that's that feels good. So it's, it's the neurotransmitter in the brain that makes you feel happy, good, and comfortable. And a, a major reason why individuals with ADHD have so much difficulty doing initiating, persisting, and completing non-preferred tasks or doing anything outside of the small, narrow ADHD comfort zone is because of just that, is because of the, the low levels of dopamine in the brain. So ADHD is a disorder of self-motivation towards new, challenging, non-preferred tasks. And a major reason why is because of these lower levels of dopamine and making it harder to reward themselves intrinsically doing these tasks. Okay. So let's talk about the part we don't agree on there, okay, which is the word you used, addiction, okay? My feeling is that, number one, the word addiction is thrown around way too liberally in our culture. You know, we, we, we tend to call everything addiction, just like I feel like we use the word trauma too, too liberally. So when I think of addiction, okay, particularly if we're talking about in the context of screens, you know, I'm thinking of something much more severe than a kid becoming dysregulated when they're asked to get off. What I'm, you know, talking about is is somebody who, you know, er, using screens to basically avoid feelings because that's what addiction is, right? It's basically using something to avoid feelings. Now, we can make the argument that that's true for a lot of kids with ADHD, but I, I think we have to be careful in terms of calling it an addiction because really when, when we look at it, it's it doesn't meet the criteria criteria of an addiction. And you know, when I've spoken with, you know, clinicians who have really seen screen addiction, it is, you know, beyond, I think, things that both you and I have seen. So, for instance, you know, somebody who, you know, will not, you know, go get up and go to the bathroom, somebody who won't eat, they've lost their jobs if they're, you know, a young adult over screen. So, 
I what I explain is that everything is on a continuum. So, you know, for kids with ADHD, we can see excessive use, we can see compulsive use, but I have to say in terms of kids, I don't really consider it to be an addiction. Your sure. thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So overall, in the work that I've done, and this is a topic I'm very passionate about. If you follow me on Instagram, I talk about screens all the time. And honestly, I am I am passionate about this topic because of just how many lives I've seen be destroyed by screens. I've just seen it time and time again. Kids that have potential through the roof, that really have great talents and great interests and can be successful. But the parents, you know, let's be honest. The parents were too scared. You know, they had fear in their body to take away those screens because they didn't want to deal with the behaviors. They were convinced their kids were going to lose all their friends because all their friends were on screens too. They didn't want to deal with the tantrums, the blow-ups, possibly breaking things in the home. So screens were never taken away. And this kid, this child, just did not have the varied experiences in life between 1 and 18 because their entire lives were spent on screens. And by the time... They age out of high school, the IEP is gone, the 504 is gone, all the support of the school is gone, and this kid is completely unemployable, they have no employability skills, and there's no chance they could be successful at college. And here you have a 25-year-old, 30-year-old living in the basement because the screen addiction was never dealt with. I do believe this is an addiction because, as we know, ADHD is highly correlated to addiction. You know, ADHD has a high correlation to alcoholism, drug use, gambling addictions, all of those things. I truly believe, and I'm I'm going off of, you know, all the case studies and the practice-based evidence I've encountered during my time in this career, that this basically is gambling. So there's, you know, casinos are places you have to go to at some place, places throughout the country, and you get to pull that slot machine. These video games, the Xbox, the Switch, the PlayStation... These are gambling systems in your house. There is there. I do not see any difference between video games and screens and casinos to the ADHD brain. They are getting such a massive dopamine rush when they play these games that there is nothing that can stimulate them besides that screen. I have a lot of parents say to me, oh, I'll let him play a couple of games as soon as he gets home from school so he can relax a little bit because school is so hard for him, and then he does homework. But then when I ask him to do homework, it's a huge fight. He can't do it. Of course it is because you're asking him to do homework, an unbelievably non-gratifying task, after doing screens. And I think one of the big telltale signs that show that it is an addiction is the vast majority of parents who are too scared to take away screens, they don't want to do it, Because in their heads, they may never admit this out loud. And some of you listening right now can probably agree with this. It's hard to agree with it, but deep down you probably do agree with it. You know if you took screens away from your child, there's a very good chance you're going to have to call 911. Because your kid is going to go off the rails, start breaking things. They may self-harm. They may say, I want to, that sentence that kids love to say, you know, in, in different ways. But obviously, it requires safety and a very specific adult response when they hear that sentence. But the fact that there's something in the house, and if that gets taken away from them, you have to call 911, you have to bring in support. I've never had a parent have to call 911 when Legos were taken away or were, you know, trucks were taken away. You know, these screens are so addictive that it's a drug. It is a straight up drug to these kids. All right. So point I don't agree with, but but let's talk about this, Mike. And I just I want to make this clear for everyone. When you're talking about addiction and what you just described, okay, and and you were you were specifically talking about what you've seen in young adults, or maybe not so young adults, correct? I would say all ages, really, you know, twenty one and below. Okay. When when you were talking about the young adults or maybe not so young adults, what, what I tend to think about with that, Mike, is that I s- could see that more with somebody with autism, okay? I can't say in my career I've ever seen that with somebody with ADHD, with, with an adult. I, I see it multiple times a week, every week. So, <laughs> so, so, so this, is, this is something I see all the time, constantly. You know, the Fortnite, Minecraft, Roblox are the big three. But these screens now, you know, there's, these video games are so different than the ones that when I were a kid. 
you know, when I was a kid, it was Nintendo 64 and GameCube, and you play for a little while, you save the game, and that's it. There was no online gaming where you're interacting with people, convincing parents that it's actually a social experience. And I think that's one thing that we are in agreement with, is that online games are not a social experience. And you're not learning any social skills by playing online games. And you're definitely not learning executive functioning skills by laying bricks in Minecraft. But overall, you know, the games now are just so constant. Stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response, back and forth, back and forth. That, you know, and Dr. Russell Barkley talks about this. The ADHD brain is hardwired towards stimulus response, stimulus right. response. And so when you, have, when you get an instant response from a touchscreen or a controller, or a keyboard, you're get it, it's feeding that dopamine drip. So, so basically what it's doing to this neurodiverse brain is very similar to a slot machine or a drug. So I would call what Mike calls addiction, I would call it compulsive use, and I would say it's problematic, absolutely, but I wouldn't consider it addiction. So that's where we differ. So I think, Mike, one of the areas where we do agree is, I mean, you brought up a few things there, but I just kind of wanted to start with this one. So when my son was in high school, I took the Xbox out of our house for a year and a half. And the reason I took it out is because, you know, I found that the more he was on it, the more it was affecting his mood, he would become more irritable. And quite honestly, he was more selfish as well. And I was doing the whole reactive parenting thing where I would get mad because of how he was acting, took it away, gave it back, took it away. And then I got to my tipping point and I said, you know what? It's leaving the house. So I think it was when he was in 10th grade. And, and I said, the Xbox is gone and it left the house and he would ask for it once in a while. And then he eventually stopped and then he got it back in 12th grade and he was a better able to handle it then because his brain was more developed. Now, you know, I would say that, no, do I think it was an addiction? No, but it was certainly affecting his mood and behavior. And that's something obviously we have both seen a lot, you know, so I, I think the one thing I wanted to say, and then let's talk about some of the common myths that you brought up, like, you know, about you know, video games help executive functioning or they're, you know, replacement for social interaction. And, and I'm just thinking, Mike, you know, I've seen some comments on your Instagram when you talked about video games and people debate you about this, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. So, yeah. So, so the American Academy of Pediatrics, their recommendation for screen time is no more than an hour on school nights, no more than two hours on weekend days. Now, they don't specify age with that, but that's their recommendation. What's your feeling about that? Because that's what I do tell parents, because I think that's reasonable. So, you know, I, I think a very important thing for parents to understand is these norms and these recommendations really tend to be for the neurotypical population. And a lot of the studies yeah. being done on screen use and the negative effects of screens are on the neurotypical population. It's very hard to find a real peer-reviewed journal-based study on screen use simply right around ADHD kids, confirmed diagnosis ADHD kids. So that's very hard. So there's lots of research showing the negative effects of screens. If there were to be a true study about the negative effects of screens on the ADHD brain, I think that would be incredibly, incredibly telling. So basically for years and years and years, and I even completed a, I even created the Grow Now screen time plan that I gave to a lot of families during the quarantine to help them create structure in the home and have limits and, you know, an hour a day here and to create visuals and those sorts of things. And since I've created that screen time plan and since quarantine and COVID and everything, honestly, things have just gotten worse. And what I'm finding is for kids with ADHD, the games are becoming more and more crazy addictive. They're becoming more and more just like Fortnite. And a lot of these parents who are exhausted, stressed, and many of them have ADHD themselves, simply can't keep up with these screen time limits. Okay, here's your start time, here's your end time. And every time the time ends, they're fighting for more. They're having behaviors. They're dysregulated. They're trying to negotiate. And then they can't do anything besides that hour of screens. So once they get an hour of screens, their screen's up, they're not doing homework. They're not reading. They're not doing chores. They're not calling friends. They're not doing anything productive because nothing can stimulate the, the ADHD brain the way screens do and arguments with parents, of course. But, but overall, what my recommendation now to parents is straight up, no more of these hour a day, hour a day, hour a day. If you were blessed with an ADHD child, you need to have a video game free house. 
and I'm being very specific about video games. If you were blessed with an ADHD child, you really should not have an Xbox, a PlayStation, a Switch in your house because it's not going to be worth the stress that it gives you. Should you have a TV? Sure, you should have a TV. In my personal opinion, there's no research to back this up, TV is the lesser of all evils because it's more passive. You just sit back, you watch it, you're not controlling it with your fingers, you're not, you know, there's no constant stimulus response. You're just sitting there. And kids do tend to get bored of TV after a while and move around. I know every kid is different, but these screen time limits are too hard for parents. So if you were blessed with an ADHD child, just like if you were blessed with a child with diabetes or Crohn's or celiac, you need to have a very specific type of kitchen, a very specific type of cupboard. You can't have those kinds of homes, those kinds of foods in your home because they're dangerous to the child. If you have a child with ADHD, I strongly, strongly recommend you do not have video games in your house. And I love that story you tell about your son, Ryan, because what I cannot say, what I need to scream from the mountaintops, is I have never in my life, in my entire career, ever worked with a family that took screens away, persevered through those behaviors for one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, a month, depending on how severe the addiction was. I've never worked with a family that took screens away and ended up regretting it. Every single one of them, with 100% accuracy, ended up reaping the benefits and seeing a brand new kid who conversed better, slept better, was more regulated, got better grades, did more things outside. It's amazing what your child can do when those screens are no longer an option for them. So I want to talk about the parts I agree with there and then don't agree with. So I, when you talk about removing screens, I don't think there's anything wrong with, at all with taking what we would call a screen detox. So even in my training about you know compulsive gaming, that's one of the things always recommended is that there's there's a screen detox for you know between one and two weeks. And and I think you know really it's to reset the brain and and kind of like you said to get back to you know a you know a state of what would we call it a state of baseline you know, baseline yeah yeah okay so what I tell families that's different from Mike is this that you know obviously I don't have such a strong feeling about this as as Mike does. But I do tell families, if you're going to have, you know, video game screens, then what I suggest is, you know, putting limits on how much during the week and the weekend and that games need to not be and video games need to not be an entitlement. They need to be something earned on a daily basis for meeting expectations. And I vary the amount of expectations kids should have based on age, but it's basically between, you know, two and six. And what I tell families is split expectations up in between behavior at home and helping out at home. So you're covering those two areas. The other thing with this I teach is that there needs to be a contract in place where there's, you know, specific parameters around, you know, playing about what games are okay, what games are not. But the other thing that I teach in my membership site in my executive function crash course series is a strategy to help kids get off of video games, which involves using, as you know, the analog clock so they can visually see the transition coming up. Because as we both know, you know, timers, the red countdown timer, those are gimmicks that do not teach you how to feel time. And they are not going to teach you how to transition away from a, you know, non from a preferred task to a non-preferred task. But one of the things, Mike, I will tell you is when when I find that people implement, you know, that strategy with with the clock and put in, you know, what I call future plan time. So the kid prepares for the transition. I do have people tell me that makes a tremendous difference in terms of the kid not getting dysregulated when they play. So I'm wondering, you know, because you know the same strategy, is that something that you recommend also, or are you too, you know, you know about this because you feel so strongly that you don't even bother with that and you just say get rid of them? Yeah. So, so my response to that would be some kids can handle that and some kids can't. So a big theme of what you constantly hear about kids and psych, kids child psychology on social media is that every behavior is communication. You hear people talk about that. Ad nausea, ad yes, nausea, you do. everything, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we want to say every behavior is communication. So what behaviors is your child having around screens? If they're having dysregulation before, after, they're obsessed with it, they're constantly asking, they're negotiating, they're trying to get more time, they're telling you with their behaviors that they're not ready for it. We know that there is an actual age and then a three to five year delay in brain age, in executive age, maybe your kid's just simply not ready for, for, ready for that. 
We don't teach kindergartners multiplication because their brains aren't ready for it. Is your child telling you with their behaviors that they're not ready for screens? And the only one can, who can answer that is you, the parent. You, the parent, are you dealing with these constant behaviors? Are screens a constant, constant fight? If they are, you're probably going to have to do one of the most difficult things and remove them. I can I can agree with you on that point. There you go. It's All about right. time. We got it. Yeah. All right, so like, let's do this. Let's talk about, I'm, I want to go through and name some of the kind of, I'll, I'm going to call them justifications I find, you know, people make for screens. Yep. The rationalizations okay. they make. Yeah, yep. the rationalization yep. uh -huh. for it, the better yep. words you use. Yeah. So I want to name them. And then after we're done that, let's talk about our, our recommendations across the board, you know, because I think it would just be good to summarize them for everyone, you know, your recommendations and my recommendations. But first, let's, let's do, do this. Okay. So I'm just going to name them and then I want you to comment on them. Okay. All right. Sure. Screen times help self-regulate. That is quite possibly the most wildest one. So screens are unbelievably dysregulating. So they may make the child happy in the moment. Are you putting an unbelievably temporary Band-Aid on this child, you know, while they're able to play a game or watch YouTube or, you know, play a computer game, those sorts of things? Afterwards, you're going to have an unbelievably dysregulated child. I make this joke a lot in my in the presentations I do from Seinfeld, Serenity Now, cr you know, craziness later. You know, this <laughs> is exactly what it is. You, you, you think your child's regulated by that screen. You are completely throwing their brain for haywire once that screen is gone. So, so if you want them to, to just play games and be sucked into the Internet and gaming world 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, fine. That's your choice as a parent. You want to do that. But once that screen is gone and you want them to go you know, exercise, go do something healthy, go play with someone face-to-face, -face, go do a chore, go apply to a job, go learn how to drive, do their common app, you know, anything that that is actually important to their life, good luck because it's not going to be as stimulating as a screen and you're going to have to deal with a lot of behaviors to get them to do the most basic task. And this is where, you know, for younger kids, this is where kids refuse to brush their teeth. Kids, kids refuse to do the most basic tasks in life because it's not as stimulating as a screen. So then the kid will say, I'm not brushing my teeth. I, I, I refuse to brush my teeth. And then we go down the vicious cycle of, self-diagnosing this child with PDA, and we go down that route. So I, I just want to say to everyone, I think Mike was being very diplomatic when he just said that's one of the <laughs> wildest things we've yeah. heard. I would say it's one of the stupidest. Yes. I'm not going to be so diplomatic. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that, is, that could not be more false. Yeah. Okay. Mike, how about this one? That, you know, video games build executive function skills. Huh. That's, that's hilarious. So, so th this, that's probably one of the most common comments I get because, you know, these parents, you know, games are pretty advanced these days. And parents who are, are of older generations like myself will watch their kids play games and the games seem pretty advanced and it seems pretty complex. And parents, are, oh, he's solving puzzles. He's solving riddles. He's building things. He's interacting with people on the, on the computer. He, he must be developing skills in no way, shape or form. Is anything your child doing on a video game, on YouTube, on any sort of screen going to translate into the natural environment? Nothing they're learning is going to help them with study skills, with academics, with working in a team, with becoming more employable. So executive function skills are not just time management and organization and building things and building fancy things in Minecraft. Are they learning to self-regulate? We just talked about that. Are they learning to self-motivate towards challenging tasks? No, because all they're doing is instantly gratifying tasks of games. So they're not learning self-motivation. They're learning screen addiction. They're not learning self-awareness, and they're not learning how to self-evaluate. So there's absolutely nothing your child can do on a screen that's going to make them more employable, more independent, or more successful academically or socially. You know, Mike, I don't remember who this was, but I was listening to a podcast and, and this question was brought up and the person said, you know, they said, you know, about, well, don't video games help build executive function skills? And the person said, well, so does going outside and throwing a ball, right? Or so does playing an instrument or, you know, making music, whatever it is. So I, I think the, the point is that, you know, if you want to help your child build executive function skills, it's not sitting in front of a screen playing Minecraft because they're laying bricks on top of each other. You know, it's 100%. through real world experiences, whether that's being creative, whether that's building something, 
whether, you know, again, playing an instrument, playing, thro just throwing a ball around. And I think we should also mention, Mike, that, and I'm sure we both agree on this, that the way executive function skills and social skills develop naturally is through unstructured play, where adults are not directing or hovering. 100%. And, and, and let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Okay. Number one, executive functions are developed, all the research shows, through varied experiences. Yes. And the big problem with screens is kids only want to do screens. Everything else besides screens sucks and is boring and is stupid. So if all they ever want to do is screens, there's no chance they're having varied experiences. They're just doing screens, screens, screens. And what else are executive functioning skills? Visual imagery, which you don't practice playing games because the screens are literally providing the visuals for you. And self-directed talk, which is not needed for gaming because you're just following the lineage of the game. So you're not using your executive functioning really at all while playing games. All right. So Mike, the next one, video games are social and it's a way to build friendships. So that right there might be the number one thing that parents have convinced themselves of, honestly, to make themselves feel better about how much their kids are playing games. Let's be honest. Parents out there, take a deep breath and think to yourself, is this really true or have I been manipulated enough? to believe that thought so I can have a little bit of peace of mind about just how damn much my kid is on screens. There is your child, like, t listen to the next time your kid is playing video games with, with peers. They're talking about, hey, pass me that gun, pass me that weapon, pass me this, build me this, do this, do this. Conversational-wise, it's not translating into the natural environment. And video game play c completely gets rid of all nonverbal communication of eye contact, facial expressions, tone, mood, body language, anything like that. It completely removes all of that. So I can't tell you how many parents tell me, oh, my son has all these video game friends. He, it's, uh, it's, it's helped him so much socially. But then that kid never ends up doing anything with kids face-to-face. -face. It's video games and that's it. How is that going to help him be successful at a job? even a basic entry-level job like working at a grocery store, working in a team, and communicating with people. In no way, shape, or form are video games social. They're not. They're being marketed as social by big tech that want you to think it's that, they want you to think that. And there's a reason why these social-based games need your credit card inputted so that your kid can, const can constantly buy new skins and new updates because it's a social thing and they're bringing that in. I can't tell you how many kids I work with that have their parents' credit cards saved on Fortnite and they've spent literally thousands of dollars just on new outfits and new weapons and new skins and all of those things. But it's okay because it's social. So 100% big tech has convinced you that video games are social. Just like for years and years and years, we were told that breakfast was the most important meal of the day. So everyone go buy, you know, go buy waffles and pancakes and cereal. Fruit from Loops. The big, yeah, Fruit Loops and all those big things. <laughs> We're being sold a lie that video games are social so that you'll spend money on them. So, Mike, I want to mention at the time we're recording this, it's January, and next month a new book is coming out. And I can't remember off the t name off the top of my head, but it's Jonathan Haidt who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind. And this new book is about child anxiety. And one of the recommendations he makes in the book, and he's a social psychologist, so this is all based on research. One of the things he talks about in the book is that kids need to have real life friendships that are not based on social media and are not based on video games. So there is research to back this up that, you know, video games, screen based relationships are not a replacement for real life in person relationships. 100%. And kids need that to develop executive functioning skills. You know, really what we're seeing now, and parents need to understand just how dire this is. Over the past couple of years, America now leads the world in first semester college dropouts. And so many of these kids were successful in, co in high school. They got the grades. They got accepted into that college for all the right reasons. They had the grades. They had the SAT scores because they had a 75-page a, a IEP. A 504 with every copy and paste of accommodation, but that jump in independence needed from 12th grade with an IEP or with a 504 to freshman year of college where you're in the dorm and you have to manage your own screen time and you have to answer your school emails and you have to set office hours with your professor on your own 
and you have to wake yourself up to go to class. Mom's not there to wake you up. These kids aren't ready for it. And a lot of it is because of the lack of varied experiences and the lack of real face-to-face -face social interactions between zero and 18 because their entire lives are spent in the virtual world. Mike, one of the things I do want to mention ab about this is that, you know, when when the times I've worked with, you know, young adults who have not made it through their first semester in college, it is never because they couldn't handle the work academically. It's never because of, you know, academic organizational skills. Almost every single time, it's because they couldn't manage their screen time. And exactly. They be right. They began, you know, oversleeping and missing class yep. and then things just snowballed. So I am completely with you on that. And yeah. this is probably one of the main reasons why I am so damn passionate about this subject is because I have worked with students for, you know, years and years and years. And of course, part of the work I do with students is parent coaching. And I'm constantly telling them, you have to get rid of screens. You have to get rid of screens. You have to get rid of screens. And obviously, all I can do is just give them the parent training and give them the recs and they take it or leave it. And I would say maybe, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the parents actually do it remove the screens or significantly eliminate the screens. But some are too nervous to do it, too scared to do it, don't want to do it for whatever reason. And the ones who don't do it, I, I tend to see those kids graduate from my services. I stop working with them and our work is done. They go on to college and they end up dropping out for that reason exactly, because the screens were not taken care of when they were kids. They go on to college and they sit in their dorm room all day eating junk food, never communicating with people, never stepping out of their dorm to make real friends. They're just on the internet, on games all day, every day, and they end up wasting lots of student loan money, lots of time, and the kid just comes home, and he's back at the parents' house, back in the basement, right back at square one. So all that work with that IEP, all that work with that 504 is wasted because the screen addiction was never taken care of. So, Mike, before we talk about our recommendations, which are obviously going to differ, one of the things I do want to clarify for everyone is I know it might sound like we're like parent bashing here, saying parents rationalize a lot of this in their head. And, and I want to say in all fairness to parents, we both know how much misinformation is on Instagram and Facebook, often spread by parenting influencers, sometimes by professionals who tell parents this stuff, right? That screens self-regulate or, you know, their social skills or whatever it is. So, so I just want to clarify for everyone, we are not parent bashing here. We want to address these common myths that parents learn. And if nobody kind of challenges those myths, then, then they're just going to accept that as reality a lot. So, yeah. And, yeah. This is, and, and, and let's be honest, this is, you know, big tech. You know, there was a reason why the heads of all these organizations, like Steve Jobs, the head of Microsoft, the head of Apple, all these things, don't give their kids screens because they know really what's happening to these things. So, you know, this is, you know, look at all of us, you know, yeah. I have a screen addiction sometimes. I'm on my phone too much, you know, looking at, you know, totally stupid things. You know, this is the world we live in. We live in a world full of distra distractions and tech and big tech and Apple and iPhones and screens and everything have made this an unbelievably difficult time to be a parent. So this is not parent bashing. This right. is really, you know, them, they are purposefully making things as addictive as possible. And another thing that we should touch on is there are many parents that fought the fight and did remove screens. And then what happened? Their kid went to school and got a laptop. Their kid went to school and right. got a Chromebook. And now that's a problem. So this is another battle parents are face facing. Many parents have done the right thing and eliminated video games and eliminated screens. And then all of a sudden their kid's coming home with a Chromebook every day and they're spending hours on YouTube and the school refuses to block it. The school refuses to do anything on the computer because, oh, hands off, can't do it. So now with schools becoming high tech, it's another hurdle parents have to face. Exactly. So, Mike, let's finish up. How about your top three recommendations for parents around video games? So I would, I would have to say the number one thing is you do want to try to implement some sort of system with the clock and the dry erase markers and, you know, coming up with a plan. The number one thing is you have to sit down with your spouse, with your partner, and come up with a plan. The number one mistake I see way too many parents make is just open access. You know, the Xbox is always there. The Switch is always there. The laptop is always there. And it's there. And parents will call, will call me and they'll say, I, I don't understand why he just doesn't do his homework in his room. Because an Xbox is in there. That's why. Like, you're expecting your kid to sit and do math homework and an Xbox is sitting right there, 
very few kids have that ability to inhibit their impulses and be on their uh, and do homework instead of being on an Xbox. So number one is get rid of open access. Number two, sit with your spouse and come up with a plan. Come up with when the screens are going to be av be available, what days, what hours, and what needs to be done before. There has to be a plan, and mom and dad, or you know wh whoever the, whoever it is, mom, mom, dad, dad, whatever it may be, uh, or a single parent, you know, sit down with a trusted friend. You need to have some sort of concrete plan. And number three, create visuals around that plan. Don't just sit down with your kid and tell them. There has to be visuals. And then number, and then the big one is if your child shows you with their behaviors that they are not using that clock, they're not listening to you, they're negotiating, they're fighting, they're dysregulated after screens, then they're telling you they're not ready for it. And they need a significant detox for as long as possible. And like I said earlier, I have never worked with a single family that took screens away and regretted it. So if you're ready to do it after hearing this podcast, take the screens away, reach out to me. Let me know how it goes. Persevere through that month of behavior where they're going to do everything they can to get those screens back. The yelling, the fighting, the breaking, the sympathy seeking, everything that they do to get those screens back, persevere through it and tell me how you see a brand new kid now, a kid that goes outside, has friends, gets better grades, eats better, sleeps better. Because at the end of the day, that's the goal. Improve quality of life. Mike, before I give my recommendations, why don't you talk about what you meant in number two about use visuals? Because I, I think a lot of people probably don't know what you mean by that. Yeah. So, you know, parents tend to instantly go for just these constant verbal prompts. Okay. So you can play games from six to seven and at seven o'clock, it's time to do this. You know, you need to have some sort of visual. You want to have that analog clock, not a digital clock not Alexa, not any of those things. You want to have an analog clock so they can see time moving with the dry erase marker like Ryan talks about in all his parent parent training videos, you know, really effective evidence-based strategies. And you want to have visuals saying, you know, from this time to this time, like we have in our screen time plan. So you want to have visuals throughout the house saying when screens are available and also what needs to be done to get those screens. Don't say, go do this, go do this, go do this, go do this, and then screens. Create a visual. Get pictures of your kids doing these tasks and create a visual checklist. All right, so my top three recommendations are, number one, we need to have parameters around screen time, and this should be you know, formalized by being written down and have an agreement about you know, how much time on weekdays, how much time on weekends. There needs to be expectations in place for earning game time so it's no longer an entitlement. And the other part of that would be, as part of the expectations, is we have an agreement about what games kids can play and not play. And what I tell parents is, and I learned this from Dr. Leonard Sachs, who's not far from Mike, that we, you know, when we're talking in the context of video games, we need to talk about which games are morally questionable. And when we talk about morally questionable, what that means is, is there killing involved? So, you know, a game like Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty, you can go around and kill people and they're pretty violent. Even in, you know, Grand Theft Auto, there's prostitution in it. So we want to keep kids away from games that are morally questionable. Um, so, yeah, my first one is my first recommendation is, you know, have a contract in place written out that's formalized with and explaining these things. Number two, that video games should be earned for meeting daily expectations. They should not be an entitlement. And number three would be to use the clock strategy. I teach an executive function crash course. So kids can learn how to transition from a preferred task to a non-preferred task. Perfectly said. And that's, and that's exactly it. So you know, like, to kind of, going off of what I said, the mistake that so many parents make is they just have open access in their house. And they kind of leave it up to their kids to choose, go outside, do homework, do chores, text a friend, go ride bikes with a friend, or play video games. And parents seem to be surprised, why is he always picking the game? Why is he always picking video games instead of being with friends outside? The answer is and always is because it's available to him. If it's available to them or her, they're going to play that game, period. They're going to lay on their phone and scroll, th scroll through TikTok. They're going to be on Fortnite. They're going to be on Minecraft because it's a heck of a lot easier and more gratifying 
than having to go out and be with someone face to face. So, Mike, let's end with this, that, you know, we've both heard plenty of parents say, well, my child doesn't like anything but video games. And tell me what your response is to that when you hear that. It's the same thing because it's always available to them. Kids are always going to choose the most instantly gratifying, easiest thing, thing that they're in full control of. They're in full control of the game with their controller, the keyboard, the phone with their finger. They're always going to choose the game if it's available to them. If their brain is hardwired towards instant gratification in games, they are going to choose that 10 times out of 10, 100 times out of 100. They're not going to start doing other things, healthier things, things that actually build executive functions until the access to the games are taken away. Or limited. In my or case. limited. Correct. Yeah. All right. So, Mike, let's finish up with this. You know, the, the one thing I tell parents when they say, well, my son doesn't like anything but video games. I always say your child needs to have varied experiences in life. And most importantly, they're not going to learn things that they're good at or make them feel good. Right. Or maybe have some mastery over if they're not exposed to different things. So if you let them just sit on video games all day, they're never going to learn really what they what they're good at. And they're not and they're losing out on confidence building experiences. One hundred percent. That is the number one way that executive functions are, are developed through varied experiences. And we grew up in a world where we think that kids are going to learn skills through worksheets, through lectures, through, you know, lessons, through a book through those kinds of things. No, the most important skill in life is executive functioning. Executive functioning is the greatest predictor of success we have for human beings. And it's developed through varied experiences and interpersonal relationships and through unstructured play. And there is no doubt we live in a world of disappearing play. Play is dying because of screens. A hundred percent. So Mike, where can everyone find you? You can find me at GrownowADHD.com and on Instagram at GrownowADHD. And you can find me, type in ADHD Dude on YouTube or Instagram, and we will talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Mike's practice, Grow Now ADHD, please visit his website at GrownowADHD.com. To learn about the services Ryan provides, please visit ADHDDude.com. You can find Mike on Instagram at GrownowADHD. And you can find Ryan at the ADHD Dude YouTube channel. The ADHD Guys podcast and content posted by either GrownowADHD or ADHD Dude is presented solely for general informational and educational purposes. The use of information on this podcast is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, licensed mental health professional, or other qualified professional, diagnosis, or treatment. Listeners should not disregard or delay in obtaining professional advice for any medical or mental health condition they or their child may have, and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.